Well, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody, to today's uh, lecture on the, in this Global Immune Talk series. Uh, my name is Dietmar Zehn. I'm a PI at the Technical University of Munich in Germany. I've recently joined a team of hosts for this uh, Global Immune Talks, and it's a really pleasure, great pleasure for me to introduce our today's speaker, Klaus Ockenhock. Um, Klaus is a professor at the uh, Department of Pathology in Cambridge. He is head of the Division of Immunology, deputy head of the Department of Pathology. He is originally from beautiful Norway. Uh, he moved over the ocean for his uh, bachelor and master and PhD studies, which he did in Canada first in Victoria, and then he moved uh, to Toronto. Afterwards, he did a very short postdoctoral uh, period at the Ludwig Institute in London. From there on, he moved to the Babram Institute, where he was for several years a, um, a, a professor and group leader. And more recently, in 2018, he moved over to direct the University of Cambridge, where he is. He has been extremely successful in academia, extremely successful in publishing. He won numerous awards, uh, got very significant grant funding from the BBRSRC, from the Wellcome Trust for the MRC. But what I found very impressive is to see on his CV that he is also very successful, successful not only in the academic world, but also in industry. He has numerous uh, collaboration with industrial partners, works as a consultant, so he is really successful in both worlds. He has been an organizer of many scientific conferences. And of course, I should also mention his key topic. He is one of the key people on understanding uh, signaling mechanisms related to co-stimulation. He has done many pioneer publications and work on understanding co-stimulation and the downstream signaling pathways, including PS3 kinases, which is his uh, topic. I'm sure we're going to hear about more about this today. And I'm very happy to have you, Klaus. And I'd like to start with a question, which is, um, you have been so successful in academia and industry. What's your secret in working so good in both worlds? That's a good question, Dietmar. So I think, um, so academia is, is like for, for many people, you know, it's about finding a good project and trying to get things published and get the grants. The um, industrial collaborations have, is something that I've been very much involved with since I first started an independent group where I've reached out to various pharmaceutical companies, small and large. And sometimes that's been successful and sometimes not. But the, the, I think, so rule number one is don't be discouraged if something doesn't come off the ground. I've been lucky because I worked on a uh, enzyme that turned out to be a really good drug target. So at the start of my career, there was enormous excitement about developing PF kinase inhibitors. So people would approach me and my attitude there is to meet up, discuss whether there is something to work together, and then you could either work at, have a research collaboration or a consultancy. And I think the third is in integrity. You know, um, many of these conversations are confidential and you, you keep them confidential and you also don't reveal. <laughs> so, and, and they will quite quickly understand whether you are someone who, who takes that kind of thing seriously. So, um, you know, if I talk to some a company, I don't talk about their unpublished work, and I certainly don't talk about things that I've discussed with another company, unless it's out in the open. So I think those are the rules, and, uh, and just enjoy it, you know, people work in, so I've met some of the best scientists I've ever met who work in companies, so don't come with the attitude that you are from academia and you know everything better. You're talking to colleagues who just have a different working model. Oh, I can't Sorry, hear you. I muted my microphone already. So <laughs> thanks a lot for this this, this very interesting uh, considerations. And now the stage is all yours for the scientific presentation. Okay, so I'll start sharing now. <clears throat> so can you now see my main slide? Yeah, excellent. So this is um, where I work. This is the Department of Pathology at the University of Cambridge. And my lab is here in this um, little red square over here. It's a big department and I lead the immunology division in this department. But we also have virology, microbiology, parasitology, 
and, and cancer research. It's a good combination of um, fields, all of which uh, we as immunologists are able to talk about. And that's part of the reason behind the, the ambitious uh, title of my talk, although I'll be focusing more about cancer than infection in this talk. So I'm just going to get my my laser pointer going here and so what i'll be talking today are about the pf kinases uh, as dietmar introduced and particularly this isoform pf kinase delta which is the key pf kinase isoform specifically in lymphocytes it will integrate a lot of signals from the t-cell receptor itself from various co-stimulatory receptors and in in t-cells icos is a key one and from cytokine receptors, which either independently or together with the T cell receptor can augment um, uh, PIF kinase signaling. PIF kinase signaling has a lot of different effect on cells. It can con control the differentiation of T cells, control various effector functions. Trafficking is a really important role for PIF kinase to control, and I'll be talking about that in the last part of my talk. Uh, and that's also relation to the really important role for PFA kinase in regulating adhesion via integrins. And again, that's something I will come back to. So this is the biochemical system we're working with. So PFA kinases are heterodimeric enzymes. They have a P85 regulatory subunit and a P110 catalytic subunit, and they become recruited to receptors that have these Y axis XM motifs. They then phosphorylate this substrate, phospholinosyl 4 pi bisphosphate, or that known as PIP2, to generate PIP3 by adding this 3-phosphate. This then acts as a membrane tether for various signaling proteins. So we'll talk a bit about AKT. I won't mention BTK so much. That's a really important as, um, protein in, in B cells, so tyrosine kinase. And I'll be talking a little bit about RASA3. So this is giving a bit of my punchline away, actually, immediately on the slide. Importantly, this process is kept in control by P10, so P10 removes this 3-phosphate, so you get PIP2 again. So PIP3 is actually a very rare um, membrane constituent. It can be as little as 0.1% of all the phosphonosotides in the cell, and raising up to maybe 1% or even 10% in a really robustly activated cells. So proteins such as these, which have pH domains that recognize PIP3, need to do so with really high selectivity to be bona fide PIP3 uh, effectors. If it has equivalent affinity for PIP2 and PIP3, for instance, well, then it won't be able to, to, do, to, to, to sense this uh, reaction here. So that's an important thing. And downstream of this, AKT is an important suppressor of FOXO, but regulates many other proteins as well, including mTOR. BTK contributes to calcium signaling and f kappa B via PLC gamma. And RASA3, I'll talk about, uh, is a very important regulate, regulator of LFA1. Now, there's additional complication because there are different isoforms of PF kinase in cells. So you have these alpha, beta, gamma, delta isoforms, basically named in the order that they were discovered. And we, we, we call it PF kinase alpha if it has a P1 and alpha iso, uh, catalytic subunits and so forth. These all catalyze the same uh, reaction, converting PIP2 to PIP3, but they have different uh, receptor engagements. So PFV kinase alpha and PFV kinase delta are strictly regulated by tyrosine phosphorylation. They bind to tyrosine kinase, uh, to, to these motifs. The gamma isoform, PFV kinase gamma, is regulated by G-protein coupled receptors. It binds to the G-beta gamma subunit that's released upon G-protein uh, G -protein coupled receptor activation. PF3 kinase beta is an interesting one. It's a coincident detector of these different signals. So it gets activated in the circumstances where you have both tyrosine kinase signaling and GPCR signaling going on at the same time. PF3 kinase beta is also different in that it's regulated by RAC rather than alpha, delta, and gamma, which have RAS as an additional regulator. Today, I will be talking mostly about PF3 kinase delta, which is highly selectively expressed in lymphocytes and expressed at very low levels, if at all, in other uh, somatic cells. There's also class 2 and class 3 PF3 kinases, which, which mainly generate this monophosphorylated species, PF3P. And although we're doing some work on, on BPS34 in the lab, I will not be discussing that specifically today. <clears throat> 
So this is a summary of, so this is a bit of a talk where we talk about published work. So uh, my career really started when I moved to London, after London, England, after my uh, PhD in Toronto, and I joined Bart van Heisebroek's lab. He had just started out a new lab at the time. And my uh, challenge when I joined him's lab was to generate a mouse mutant. Now I came from Toronto actually, where Tac Mac was making, was very famous for making a lot of knockout mice. But with this one, we took a slightly different approach in that we generated a kinase dead mouse. So we introduced a single point mutation into the catalytics subunit of PFA kinase delta. And I'm pretty sure that we were the first one to do this, to genetically engineer a kinase dead mouse. And we did that in order to keep these P85, P110 complexes intact, but just catalytically inactive. And we used these mice initially to demonstrate that PFA kinase delta plays an important role, both in B cell receptor and T cell receptor signaling. And you see some examples here that we have reduced proliferation and IL-2 production and so on. And then we follow this work up by showing that PFA kinase delta regulates T helper cell differentiation, um, it controls the magnitude of the CD8 response to, for instance, uh, listeria infections. And also today I want to talk about work we did where we showed initially that PFA kinase delta plays a really important role in regulatory T cells. And this actually has an uh, important impact on PFA kinase delta as a target for cancer immunotherapy. So I'm going to summarize some of that work in particular in the next few slides uh, and then move on to some more recent work we have done. So initially in the original paper, we could show that PFT kinase delta def deficient mice had inflamed colon. And this immediately drew our attention to work, particularly from Fiona Powery and colleagues who had shown that mice with reduced Treg function also had um, in in inflamed uh, colons and developed colitis. Uh, and indeed, when we looked at regulatory T cells, we saw that despite having increased abundance of regulatory T cells in the thymus, PRT kinase delta deficient mice had reduced proportions of regulatory T cells in peripheral lymph node organs. Moreover, if we induced colitis in RAG knockout mice by injecting activated T cells, we could completely suppress induction of colitis with wild-type regulatory T cells, but we could not do so if we injected PFA kinase delta deficient T regs. So this showed us that PFA kinase delta plays an important role both in T, cell, T regulatory T cell function as well as possibly in terms of T reg homeostasis. Now I'm going to backtrack a little, sidetrack, and this is related to Dietmar's introduction about the emergence of PFA kinase inhibitors. So when I was doing my PhD, we had two inhibitors to choose from. They were called wartmanin, which is a, a, a natural product from a, 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 a bacterial product. And, and this compound we often call the Lilly compound, uh, produced, generated initially by Eli Lilly, called LY294002. Both of these can, act, can inhibit PFC kinase. And if you use these kind of compounds and they do nothing to your cell of interest, then PFC kinases probably aren't involved. However, they are not particularly selective, and, and they inhibit all the different PFA kinases, as well as some protein kinases that are related to PFA kinases, and even some unrelated protein kinases. So there was a need for more selective uh, drugs, particularly if these were going to be developed into drugs to use in humans. And over the several years now, many such inhibitors have been uh, identified. So we have PFA kinase alpha, beta, uh, gamma and delta selective inhibitors. So these are highly selective, often with a 10 to fold, uh, fold selectivity of one isoform over all of the others. This compound here, which I'll talk a little bit more about, it LALSIP was the first PFA kinase delta inhibitor to be approved. This was uh, approved for the treatment of chronic lymphocytic leukemia by Gilead. More recently, PFA kinase alpha selective inhibitor has also been approved. This is approved for treating breast cancers, which very often have mutations in PFA kinase alpha, the gene for PFA kinase alpha, which is called PIK3CA. In fact, it's an interesting approval because it's approved specifically for uh, patients who have mutations that activate PFA kinase alpha in these cancers. Um, um, the copanilisib has is a pan pfa kinase inhibitor that's given by injection. That's also in, uh, approved for uh, for uh, uh, leukemia, uh, uh, and we also have these gamma and the dual inhibitor duvelisib. Uh, 
So we've recently reviewed some of this where we claim that PSA kinase inhibitors have finally come to age. A little bit controversial because there may, there's also been uh, some difficult uh, experiences with these inhibitors in terms of adverse effects and so on. And I'll talk a little bit about that now next. So, I'm, so we're focusing then on idlalisib, which is a PSA kinase delta inhibitor. So this is the initial trial that led to the approval of PSA kinase delta inhibitors. So these are patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And you can see that patients who were given adlalosib had much better progression-free survival than those who were given a placebo. In fact, at this stage, it was obvious that even though this was a double-blind study, that the doctors treating these patients could clearly see who had gotten the drug and who hadn't. So they unblinded it and gave all of these patients here the option of taking the idlalosib going forwards. Now, it works by an interesting mechanism. So PSA kinase delta inhibitors are not particularly cytotoxic to a CLL cell in isolation in culture. What happens is that when patients are given these inhibitors, the, the leukemic cells are purged from the lymph nodes and from the bone marrow and into circulation. So initially there was a massive increase in, in, in these lymphoblasts in the blood of patients, but then eventually these then ended up dying, often because they had been removed from their protective uh, stromal environment but also uh, they became more susceptible to other drugs given at the same time. In this case, rituximab, which is an antibody that kills B cells. So that's an important thing that PFT kinase delta interfered potentially actually with the adhesion of these cells to protective stromal cells. Now, what was noticed, just like the mice that I told you about that we had uh, described a decade earlier, was that many of these patients eventually developed colitis. This was quite slow, so you can see that it, uh, it takes several months often before the colitis uh, uh, manifests itself. <clears throat> but in very many cases, this was a severe colitis which led to discontinuation of the drugs. And as a, so as a consequence, this uh, drug well, is now it has a black label uh, warning to doctors that patients can very quite frequently develop colitis. They also have increased liver enzymes, which we are pretty convinced is due to an immunological effect. And in rare cases, they can get pneumonitis, which in some very unfortunate cases was lethal. So right now, idlalosib is not prescribed very frequently, I have to say, despite its very effectiveness. And this is in part because other drugs with a better safety profile against BTK, for instance, and also against BCL2 are, 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 are more commonly prescribed. So what can we learn from this experience? Well, of course, we compare a lot of our, uh, we are all aware now of how, and you've heard about it in the seminar series, of how antibodies that target CTLA-4 or PD-1, or so-called so checkpoint, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and they block these inhibitor signals, either CTLA-4 here or PD-1. And the, the, the dogma is that CTLA-4 works a lot during the priming phase in the lymph node, where the T cells will interact with dendritic cells expressing the ligand CD86, whereas PD-1 perhaps works more in the tumor marker environment itself, where it interferes with the PD-1 interacting with PD-L1. Now, um, there's a second effect uh, uh, described by Sergio Quezada and others showing that antibodies can CTLA-4 can also lead to Treg depletion, a little bit as I've described for PFA kinase delta. And it's interesting to note actually that many of the adverse effects experienced by patients who took idlalosib are similar to those who have given some of these in immune checkpoint inhibitors, particularly ones who have given CTLA-4 or a combination of CTLA-4 and PD-1. So this hints that there are some commonalities actually between uh, the, the uh, PSA kinase delta inhibition and checkpoint immunotherapy. And indeed, we were quite surprised initially when we started injecting our PSA kinase delta deficient mice with tumors, which we initially had actually thought that they may be highly susceptible for because they had defective effector immune cell function. But we found actually a significant proportion of PSA kinase delta deficient mice um, survive these challenges. And in fact, they were able to reduce the size of these tumors and in some cases eliminate them altogether. Moreover, if we deleted PSA kinase delta selectively in regulatory T cells, we had an even better protection. 
This could also be reproduced if we took wild-type mice and gave them PIF kinase delta inhibitors. Again, we could see in an immune-dependent manner that tumor cells were being eliminated. Now, Christian Rommel saw this data <clears throat> even before it was published and immediately thought he would uh, uh, do a clinical trial to see if this could be re reproduced in, in humans. And this paper was just published uh, um, th this last year. And I won't go into it in great detail, but this was a, uh, um, a window trial. So patients with head and neck cancer, a cancer that doesn't express much PFI kinase delta. So this was an immunotherapy trial where they had a tumor biopsy. Then they were given the drug for about uh, <clears throat> for, for for about 24 days before they came back in for their scheduled resection of the tumors. And what this enabled uh, uh, Christian Rommel, uh, Christian Osenmeyer and colleagues to do was to compare the immunophenotype in these tumors before and after treatment. And what indeed they find very consistent with the mice was there was a reduction in, in regulatory T cells in these tumors. And there was an increase in CD8 cells that expressed genes associated with an effective immunotherapy, so grand Zan B, uh, interferon gamma, and so forth. So although this was a failed trial, some of the patients had such severe uh, side effects that they didn't compete, even complete this very short trial. Um, it was very informative that it showed that in humans, as we had shown previously in mice, this strategy can be used as an immunotherapeutic strategy. Now, there's another complication that I'll just briefly summarize here. So we thought, great, and like everyone thinks in the field, actually, we have a um, immunotherapy here. If we can combine it with CTLA-4 or PD-1, it'll be even better. So these are experiments here where you can see that you have a wild-type mouse treated with anti-CTLA-4, and we, we treat this tumor very well. Um, and this, to some extent, also works in the piatikinase delta deficient mouse, but we didn't really see any synergy here. Now you can see this treatment worked so well that synergy might not have been, it would have been hard to detect, but if anything, actually the tumors were slightly bigger in the PSC delta deficient mice. And this situation was even worse when we looked at, at PD-1 treatment, where we found that anti-PD-1 was very, very effective in the wild type mice, but did not work at all really in the PSC delta deficient mice. So we have a challenging situation here because PD-1 we know works in part by inhibiting PFI kinase delta. So anti-PD-1 to some extent will release this inhibition. And this is probably a really important mechanism in effective T cells. Now CTLA-4 has a similar effect, has also been shown to impact on, on AKT signaling in particular by activating dysphosphatase PP2A. So part, and I'm saying this is only part of the mechanism of these checkpoint inhibitors, is that they can unleash PFI kinase and other signaling pathways in T cells. But of course, in the PFI kinase delta deficient T cell, that operation, that mechanism would not be operational. However, um, in the PFI kinase delta deficient situation, it seems that the depletion of Treg function is the dominant effect, then allowing some suboptimal CD8 T cells to do their uh, business. So talking then about hyperactivation of, 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 of PFI kinase in T cells, we stumbled upon another discovery that profoundly influenced our lab and the direction of our research. So these were local families here in Cambridge who had inherited immunodeficiencies. And the pattern of inheritance suggested a dominant effect so that there was a roughly 50% of, 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 of affected families who, who would have this uh, mutation, uh, this disease. It was, a, it was a serious immunodeficiency. You can see here age of, of individuals presumed to have had this mutation who died at a very young age. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so we were involved in, 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 in uh, Sergei Nijensev and colleagues sequenced these patients and found a mutation in PFI kinase delta in the gene for PFI kinase delta, which is called PIK3CD. Now, what was unusual uh, about this mutation, and this was initially shown by uh, Roger Williams and colleagues, is that it led to an increased activity of PFI kinase delta, whereas most mutations that cause immune deficiency lead to loss of function. 
This, of course, uh, explained why this is a, 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 is a dominant uh, effect, because you only really need one allele of this activating mutation. So we call this disease activated PF kinase delta syndrome, so people knew what, what, what the underlying cell, um, molecular pathology was. Um, and uh, I don't have time to describe all of these patients, but they have in common that they develop respiratory uh, problems as a result of a defective Im Im immune response. They get frequent pneumonia that often leads to bronchiectasis. A significant number of these patients will also develop lymphomas, and they're particularly B cell lymphomas as a consequence of high PF kinase activity in B cells. Now, the exactly why hyperactivation of this, which you could, in a very simplistic view, think about might actually lead to enhanced immunity, leads to an immune deficiency, was non obvious. So, to try to address this, we generated a um, mouse model of this disease which you can read more about in this uh, publication here. I won't go into great detail what we found, but we, uh, uh, in an inducible matter, in a cre-dependent matter, we induced this, this activating mutation. So we could look at the effect of this mutation in different cell types, in T cells, B cells, myeloids, and so forth. And really what we found in this publication here was that it was the activated PF kinase delta in, in B cells that seems to increase susceptibility uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of to to infection by strep, uh, streptococcus to lead to strep pneumonia, and and we identified a, what we think is a novel B cell subset here that seems to have an adverse effect on on on, on this Im immediate infection. But what you can see here biochemically is that if we measure PIP3 in these T cells, the product of PFA kinase, it's massively increased by this mutation, and importantly, we could suppress this activity using a PF kinase delta selective inhibitor. In this case, one that, that we were given by GlaxoSmithKline, which they were starting to test as an inhaled inhibitor in patients with the, um, COPD. Here, this is probably an assay you may be more familiar with, where we could show that if you look at phosphate-AKT, this is massively increased now in mice with the activating mutation, E1020K, but abrogated in mice with the inactivating mutation, the original mice I generated, D910A. So it's very useful for us now to have mice that either have hyperactive PSC kinase or kinase dead uh, versions of this enzyme to com compare and contrast what happens with these. And you can also see that this effect also works downstream. PSC kinase, by mechanism we still don't understand, affects the MAP kinase pathway, ERK signaling, and by mechanism we understand very well FOXO, which is a direct target of, of, of AKT. And as a consequence of hyperactive, this is an example here of T cells. This is probably the one unpublished work slide I'll show in this talk. You can see that that in the in, in mice with the activated allele, you have fewer memory cells which are intact with the kinase dead allele, um, but you have more short-lived effectors in the activated allele uh, with, than with the kinase dead allele. This is kind of as you would uh, predict based on some of the previous work we have done and others, including our collaborators. So getting back to this then, so now to get to the final talk, part of the talk, where I'll talk a little bit about the effectors of PF kinase. So I would say that 90% of the field working on PF kinase have looked at the activation of AKT. So this is the best, um, most evolutionary conserved enzyme. So you can find AKT activated in this pathway in C. elegans and every other organism where this enzyme is expressed. There's an in immunologist are familiar with BTK, where, in which PIP3 is, uh, augments the activity of this enzyme. But altogether, there are probably about 50 to 100 proteins in the cell that can be bound by PIP3. And we know preciously little about many of these other proteins, what their physiological roles are. So this is something that our lab was really, really interested in addressing. And if you just look at this actually from an um, evolutionary point of view, it's interesting to see that if you go from yeast to C. elegans to sophila and human, um, okay, we have more genes than the yeast, but actually, and we don't have an order of magnitude more uh, genes than C. elegans or drosophila. Um, um, now, the number of PFA kinase subunits have increased, so the yeast only have one. <clears throat> um, 
to two in this in C elegans, and then and then the Drosophila have four, and humans have eight catalytic subunits. So they've increased. But what really has increased exponentially are the effector proteins. So here there is a step chain between these model organisms and humans or mice, where you have, and this is probably an underestimate, but we have massively expanded the arsenal of proteins that can transmit PR3 kinase signaling. So um, before I get to that, I'll just remind you that um, in immune cell trafficking, we have really important role for integrins. So as the cells uh, travel through uh, the capillaries in the, um, and if they become activated, they will bind to their ligands, integrins, which will cause the diapedidis uh, of the cells and into tissues, for instance. And uh, one of the important integrins here is called LFA1, which binds to ICAM1, but there are many other integrins too. And this process is regulated um, both by antigen receptor signaling, actually, but also by uh, chemokines. Another important role for, for, for LFA1 is this was one of the first proteins to be uh, shown to be very um, in the immune synapse, where, where LFA1 sur surrounds the central, uh, the CSMAC here, uh, and is sort to keep the, the, the interaction between the T cell and the antigen presenting cell. To, to, together. So you can see integrins here at the, at the periphery of the central area here where all the signaling goes on. So these are two distinct processes where integrins are thought to be really important. Now, when you look at LFA1 on a resting cell, it can't bind to anything because it's in this bent low affinity stage. Upon T cell activation, either through the antigen receptor or through chemokine receptors, it extends such that it becomes a high affinity receptor for its ligand ICAM1. So you need to stimulate the cell in order for LFA1 to bind to its ligand. Another thing that happens, which I will not go into great detail in this talk, is it also oligomerize. So you also get increased affinity, but you, at the same time, you also get increased avidity. So we were interested in this potential link between PF3 kinase signaling and integrins. There have been quite a few papers in literature su 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 suggesting that PF3 kinase actually do control uh, integrin affinity. And these are some of the proteins that had been presumed to be involved, or at least hypothesis, often with some experimental detail, to be involved in this. But the picture was rather incomplete. So we wanted to take, do some more work to try to understand really what is the protein that links the production of PIP3, shown here, to the regulation of LFA1, shown here, along with a large molecular complex known to regulate LFA1 here. And I'll be talking a little bit about RAP1, which is a really key regulator of LFA1 affinity. So in initial experiments, we used our uh, either our PF kinase delta deficient mice, the d 19 mutation, or wild type mice. We stimulated these mice with anti-TCR, and then we incubated these T cells with ICAM1, which we labeled fluorescently and did a flow cytometric assay. So what you can see here in unstimulated cells, ICAM1 will not stick to unstimulated cells. But when we activate these T cells, you get very rapid increase in, in LFA1 activity, which then subsides over the next several minutes or up to half an hour. And you can see that this was much lower in, in, in kinase dead uh, cells. So this is work by a former postdoc in my lab, Fabian Garçon. Now, and we could mimic this using drugs, and this was unusual for many of the things that we measure in the lab that are PFE kinase dependent. So again, here, this is a control cells here. We add PFE kinase inhibitors, either PFE kinase delta selective inhibitor or a pan inhibitor, and we really suppress um, binding to ICAM1 in a manner comparable to what we see in the kinase dead mutant. Interestingly, however, a very potent AKT inhibitor did not have this effect. It suppressed LFA1 a little bit, but not a lot. So now we had a system we could use, where, which was PIT kinase dependent, but at least not entirely AKT dependent, which led to us that we could discover other mediators. What we also found in the PIT kinase delta deficient mice was they had reduced induction of RAP1. And you may recall in the previous slide, I told you that RAP1 is an important regulator of, of uh, LFA1. And in fact, we could show if we introduced an activated allele, activated 
RAP1 into T cells, we could rescue uh, LFA1 uh, uh, affinity. So we then set up an assay um, uh, uh, to, 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 to explore this further. So, so what I'll talk about now for the rest of the talk is a collaboration here with uh, Pam Schwartzberg at NIH, less led by my, uh, a shared student of ours, Christopher uh, Johansson. So he extended the work from Fabien by showing that it, with, in mice with the activated allele, we had massively increased binding to LFA1 and he could reproduce the data showing in the kinase dead allele, we had reduced uh, uh, LFA1. So this was really nice. We have a nice quantitative assay here with a good dynamic range where we, inhibition goes one way, hyperactivation goes the other way. So this is a really good setup if you want to set up a CRISPR screen. So uh, Christopher did some initial work here where he transduced T cells with um, which expressed Cas9 already with various guides. And very nicely here, he could show you have the, uh, the non-specific guide RNA here as a control. You could transduce these T cells with a guide against PFE kinase delta. You reduce LFA1 binding, so you have much more cells here that don't bind. If you knocked out uh, P10, then you have massively increased binding um, uh, to LFA1. And of course, there's a really nice control here to just knock out, knock out LFA1. We don't see any ICAM bindings at all. So the assay is specific. None of these treatments um, interfered with the expression level of LFA1, except uh, when we knock out uh, LFA1 specifically. But um, modulating PSA kinase delta or PSA kinase signaling has no impact on the expression levels of LFA1. So then Christopher went and he designed a library of guides against all proteins that bind to PIP3, or that could potentially bind PIP3. Now he did this with a rather wide brush. So I told you not all pH domains are able to distinguish PIP3 from PIP2 or indeed other inositides. But Christopher didn't care, so he targeted all the pH domains, whether they were thought to bind PIP3 or not. And he also scoured the literature through various proteomics, uh, uh, um, approaches and so on that had identified other potential PIP3 binders that didn't have pH domains. And he made four guides against all of these genes, which he pulled into a larger uh, library. So it's important to estimate that we're really going here for PIP3 binders, but we've caused, we've uh, um, thrown the net rather wide so that we have included here many proteins that aren't necessarily PIP3 binders. So then this was the setup of the screen. So this is a screen that really has approached that Bonnie Huang in, 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 in PAMP's lab had set up initially, where he, he, he pulled all of these guides together. He transduced them in bulk into activated T cells. And then he, he, he did a, his ICAM binding assay. And of course here you can see some T cells which have low ICAM binding and some T cells here that have high ICAM binding. The prediction is that if we interfere with guides <clears throat> um, that with, 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 guide, with genes that are suppressing um, LFA1 binding, then they should be enriched here. Whereas if we uh, inf uh, interfere with genes for proteins that enhance ICAM binding, they should be here because we've removed those genes, so we lose LFA1 activity. And these are the results from the screen shown in a few different ways. So we started with this library. You see here in blue here, you see um, examples of where uh, um, ICAM binding was lost. And as a control here, we have, uh, and actually I'll show the control in the next slide because it's a bit difficult to see here. And here on this side, you have genes where actually we had massively increased uh, LFA1 binding. And you can see here as a control, that, 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 that the guides tended to go in the same direction when they had an effect. So Christopher used a bunch of statistics to show some of the most significant genes here. And it was really reassuring to see that P. kinase delta was highly selective as a loss of function type of protein, whereas P10, which we've also looked at before, was very selective as a, a gain of function. Uh, and just looking a little bit closer here, so you can see some of our top, our top hit really was P10, but RASA3 also came up as a top hit. And I've already hinted that this is a protein we become very interested in. 
Whereas on the other side here, you can see LFA1, okay, we, we, not surprising. But Kindlin is actually a PIP3 binding protein that was already known to mediate um, LFA1 activity. So it was reassuring for us to see that that, that that also precipitated out of the screen. This gave us confidence that this screen was really working. And again, you can see P. kinase delta here also as one of the key effectors required for this. Lots of other proteins also had effects. And for most of these, we haven't had a chance to follow up through. And certainly if anyone who listens to this seminar has ideas about some of these proteins, either because you've gone to look at the paper or whatever here, we'd love to hear from you because there's a, these screens give up a huge resource for, for, for looking at these kind of things. So what about RASA3? So RASA3 is this multidimensional protein here. It's got the pH domain. It's got what's called a RAS gap, but I'm going to try to convince you that this is really a RAP gap. And it has CDC2 domains that also help uh, co-localizing it to the membrane. So um, RASA3 can catalyze then um, the, the, the deactivation of RAP1. So RAP1 is active when it's GTP bound, but in presence of RASA3, it'll you hydrolyze GTP, so you are GDP bound and they have an in, uh, inactive enzyme. And then there are other enzymes like Haldag and GIF1 that, 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 GIFI, that can activate RAP1 again. Now, very curious, and this is work by Ingeborg Hurst and colleagues had shown in platelets that the evidence that PFC kinase somehow could inactivate RASA3. Now that's very unusual. And I think it's the only example I'm aware of where binding to PIP3 actually suppresses a protein. So we were very curious to see would this also be the case in T cells. And we had hints that it was because RASA3 came out as one of our, our top targets uh, as genes that suppress um, uh, uh, LFA1 binding. And, uh, and we, we know that RASA3 is a very, very potent PIP3 binder. It's one of the top of the list, actually, when people have done screen for various PIP3 binders. Another interesting feature of RASA3 is this is a gene that's acutely suppressed. The expression is acutely suppressed upon T cell activation. And this makes a lot of sense, because if RASA3 is suppressing LFA1, well, when you want activated T cell, you often want LFA1 to be activated uh, so that you can stick to dendritic cells or to endothelial walls and so forth. So it makes sense actually that the T cells reduces the expression of, of RASA3 upon activation. And this has also been shown at the protein level using proteomic approaches by Doreen Cantrell and, and, and others. So we uh, validated uh, RASA3 as a target using our individual CRISPR approach here. So here you can see a wild type uh, T cell stimulated um, we knocked out P10 as a control, which I've shown before, and you have massively increased LFA1 binding. And similarly here, when you knock out RASA3, you see increased binding um, to ICAM1. So RASA3 really is a bona fide suppressor of LFA1 activity. We were fortunate to get some RASA3 conditional knockout mice from Wolfgang uh, Bergmeier, who also had been working on, on platelets, just like Ingeborg Hers. And we cross these mice with a CD4 Cree to eliminate RASA3 from all T cells. And reassuringly, Christopher found that when they stimulated these T cells, they had increased binding to ICAM1. And this was true, true both in CD8 cells and in, in, in CD4 cells. So the knockout approach therefore validated the CRISPR knockouts. <clears throat> Interestingly, this is a bit of a complicated slide, so be patient. What Christopher next did was some rescue experiments. So he started here with RASA3 knockout T cells, and it's easiest to see this in the CD8 blasts here. <clears throat> when he introduced RASA3 back into these cells, then you reduce binding to ICAM1. You've essentially now created a wild type cell. If you introduced a catalytic inactive form of RASA3, you did not rescue the phenotype because the catalytic activity, the gap activity of RASA3 is essential for RASA3 function. Initially, the next result seems counterintuitive, but I think it makes sense, but I'll take you through it. When he introduced a pH mutant of RASA3, so this is a RASA3 mutant that can't bind to PIP3, the suppression was even better than doing wild type RASA3. 
So RASA3 seems to work better if it doesn't have a pH domain. So how do we explain that? Um, first, before I get to that, um, some other experiments that Christopher did, he could show that in the absence of RASA3, we had higher levels of GTP bound RAP1. Um, these are challenging assays to do in primary cells, but we did it many, many times <laughs> to show this significant. And actually, perhaps the most important, um, uh, sorry, uh, most important thing here was that you, should, you can see here in the wild type cell, idlalacib will suppress RAP1 GTP activity in a stimulated T cell. However, in a RASA3 knockout, you can no longer suppress uh, GTP bound RAP1 using idlalacib. So in this case, because you don't have RASA3, you've eliminated the need for PSV kinase to activate uh, uh, RAP1. So the idea here is that without RASA3, you can also bypass the role for PFA kinase. So the role of PFA kinase here is really an in, to inhibit the inhibitor. And if you take bo uh, both away, you are back to square one. So how does this uh, RASA3 mutant behave then? So here you see a wild type T cells into which we have introduced um, RASA3 labeled uh, uh, tagged with GFP. And you can see that RASA3 moves nicely to the surface. Whereas the pH mutant stay, stays in the cytosol, it doesn't move to the plasma membrane like the wild type version. We can mimic this here also um, using idlalacib. So here you see again the wild type T cells, you see RASA3 nicely here going to the, surf, to the plasma membrane, and this does not happen when we block uh, RASA3. So paradoxically though, this mutant, which doesn't go to the plasma membrane, is really effective at suppressing LFA1. And how that works, we don't know yet. Um, we have some, sorry. Um, it looks like I'm missing a slide here. So I'm going to take it. We have some evidence that uh, potentially um, um, uh, RASA3 um, um, that we, our, our current hypothesis is that the immune in, in, within the immune synapse, RASA3, so I'm missing a slide, so I got thrown off a little bit there, that RASA3 may be, may be pulled away from this uh, in, initial activation where, uh, all the way out to the PSMAC, where, whereas PIP3 may be regulating act, activation of, of, of integrins much closer to the, to the CSMAC uh, or, or, uh, here. But, but uh, sorry, to the distal smack, that RASA3 goes all the way out to the distal smack, and that, that, that um, genes like Kindlin3 and so on may be more here and, and the C smack and P smack. But, but we have yet to, to have uh, firm evidence for that. So this remains very much a hypothesis. Now, in terms of trafficking, I'll just finish on, on this. So as you, are, you will be aware that, that, that um, that, 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 that the T cells come in here uh, through the artery and, and then in the post uh, uh, high end of uh, thelial venules here, they will leave uh, here uh, by diapedesis and go into the lymph nodes where eventually they, 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 they interact with B cells or, 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 or then depart through. through uh, uh, so, so uh, using uh, advanced microscopy, um, we were able to look at that to see how RASA3 would impact the ability of T cells to leave the high endothelial venules and enter into the lymph nodes. And I'm only going to show one slide. If you want to see more detail about that, again, you're going to have to go and have a quick look at our paper. And now, hopefully, this is going to work. Um, so here, what you can see here are green wild type cells, which move freely out of these high individuals and into the lymph nodes. Whereas what you see here are RASA3 knockout cells, which get to these high endothelial uh, venules, but really struggle to get out of them. So what we're, we're finding here is that because they have such high LFA1 activity, they're unable to dissociate from ICAM1, which is uh, coated onto these high thelial venules. This has rather a profound impact on the trafficking of these cells in general. So they are slow to get into lymph nodes, 
they are also slow to get out of lymph nodes. So as a net result of this, we have impaired trafficking, we have impaired recruitment of these uh, to have an effective immune response. And in fact, what we've shown as a consequence of this is that we have defect, defects in, 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 in the recruitment for, and of, of follicular helper T cells, for instance, into the germinal centers to facilitate help for B cells. As, as a consequence of this, these mice have defective antibody responses. But I'm running out of time, so I don't have time to go through all of the data there, but it's all in the paper. So this really shows the impact and is refocusing our attention, actually, when we think of PIC kinases, to really consider the impact of the PIC kinases on the ability of T cells to adhere to, to their substrates. We think this is also really, really relevant for the B cells. So you remember one of the earlier slides, I told you about the patients who were treated with lalacib and the B cells were purged out of the lymph nodes and into circulation. And probably a lot part of that effect also is the reduction in uh, affinity. I also showed an example of a human trial with the Amgen inhibitor in the head and neck cancer. And what was found there was that yes, T regs were depleted from the tumors, but there was a consequent increase of activated T regs in circulation of these patients. So I do wonder if part of the effect of PFKI's delta inhibitors as a, as a cancer immune therapeutic is that they purge regulatory T cells from the tumor mark environment. But again, this is a hypothesis that remains to be tested more formally. So in summary then, I've told you that PFI kinase delta transmits T cell receptor and B cell receptor and costimatory signals, that the inhibition of PFI kinase delta impairs regulatory T cells. This leads to colitis, which is an unfortunate adverse effect, but can also enhance anti-tumor um, immune responses. Hyperactivation, mutations that lead to hyperactivation of PFI kinase leads to activated PFI kinase delta syndrome, and finally, that we've identified RASA3 as a novel PIP3-dependent protein that controls LFA1 in T cells. So I'd like to finish by acknowledging many lab members who have contributed to, to, to this work. The last part of this was by Christopher Johansson. Many of these others have, have helped massively in the characterization of APDS and also in, in the RASA3. These are current lab members here, who you see here on the recent punting trip along the River Cam wonderful collaborators listed here, and particularly Pam Schwartzberg for much of the work that I talked about here. These are funding regions, my Twitter handle if you want to ask some questions, and our lab either punting at the conference here or at the nice lab picnic. And I do want to particularly um, pay tribute to Pam Schwartzberg, who's been a fantastic and generous collaborator. It probably is the most enjoyable collaborator, and we were fortunate enough to have uh, Christopher Johansson as part of this welcome NIH program where he spent two years with Pam and two years in my lab and really drove this. So on that notice, I'm happy to take any questions, which I understand may or may not come through Twitter rather than through the chat here. Well, thanks, Klaus, for this really, really wonderful and very stimulating talk. And um, as you all know, we are usually ending our presentations here, our recording and our streaming. And we would like to encourage everybody to join Klaus on Twitter. You can find here the uh, way how you can the access. And uh, look forward to seeing many questions uh, on Twitter. And I also I'd like to mention and feature our next week's presentation. So we're gonna have Facundo Batista, same time, same location. And with that, I end the meeting. Thanks, Klaus, again. And thank you all for your interest in our series.